Hello and welcome to the Eye on the U podcast, the Miami Herald's Miami Hurricanes podcast. I'm David Wilson and I'm joined as always on the other line by Susan Miller Degnan, our Hurricanes beat writer here at the Herald. Susan, what's going on? Um, nothing much, just UMFSU. Yeah, it's Florida State week, always an exciting week. Um, Miami coming off a um, memorable, but um, I think a game that everyone wants to forget four overtime win at Virginia. Um, now they get the Seminoles. I uh, were coming off um, a blowout win against Georgia Tech, um, kind of fringe top 25. So a Miami, pretty big underdogs, considering it's a home game in Miami, Florida State, where neither team are, is ranked or you know a real contender of any kind. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a little surprising, but at the same time, as we said, it's a, it's a rivalry game. Anything can kind of happen. Um, and Miami, uh, you know, the, uh, like I said, the, it was a victory to forget as memorable as it was on Saturday. Um, but still, I, I think some positive signs there. And, and if anything, it's just that Jake Garcia now has a start out of the way, didn't turn the ball over. Um, I think he's got a lot of moxie, right? You know, scrambling for a game winning touchdown or game winning two point conversion, I guess. Um, we're not <laughs> right. sure yet who's going to start. Um, could be Tyler Van Dyke. Uh, Mario Cristobal said they're optimistic about him. And then Will Mallory said he's been practicing this week and looking good. Um, but at the same time, I think we all thought that was going to maybe be a multiple week injury. Uh, Kane Sport at on three.com actually had reported last week that he was they're going to probably wait until after the Florida State game to reevaluate him. So it seems like no matter what, he's ahead of schedule. But the big question for Miami, I think, going into this week, uh, well, obviously one is who's going to start a quarterback. And if it's Jake Garcia, um, is he ready for the challenge? And if it's Jake Garcia, how many years in a row will this be with different starting quarterbacks for Miami? It's like seven years, right, that a different quarterback oh, has started wow. the Florida State game? If it's yeah. Jake, you go Jake, Tyler, Dierick. Um, Jared, well, that last year, Nicosi, Rozier, I think. Rozier, it was Rozier, right. yeah. Tyler, I, I mean, last year he was attempting to become the fifth different Miami quarterback right. so in five years. This, I, so this would be, he'll be the sixth, if Jake starts, he's the Jake. sixth different quarterback to start against Florida State in the last six years. Um, I guess let's yeah. start with Jake. We'll get, you know, we'll talk about the Tyler status and, and we'll talk a little recruiting at the end too, because um, Miami got a couple of commitments last week, including a, a stunner from five-star cornerback Cormani McClain. Um, what did you – so Jake, obviously, he comes in in that Duke game um, and is kind of awful, right? Throws two touchdowns early and then a bunch of interceptions, loses a couple fumbles. Um, this week, statistically, like nothing eye-popping, but takes care of the ball, um, yes. leads a couple in- – Important touchdown drives. Henry Parrish gets going, so they really lean on the run. And then, like I said, at the end of the game, um, runs in for a two-point conversion. Um, what do you take away from from Jake Garcia's first start? And um, I don't know how. Like how how would you kind of grade it? You don't have to put in a letter on it, but how how would you how are, how do you feel coming? I, I, start, I mean, especially if he's got to start this weekend. I I think because of the way it ended his grade goes up. Yeah. I, I think his confidence goes up. I think you're right. It was an ugly, <laughs> crazy game, but the fact that Miami won, um, everything is different in there. I think the way they're yeah. feeling going into this one and, you know, a win is a win as they say. And it's, and as far as Jake goes, I, I mean, it was, it was tough, very tough for him. He did he, he he was nervous. Uh, he said he wasn't, but he had to be nervous. I, or he didn't do that great, but yeah, frazzled, he, maybe well, he was definitely he was frazzled, frazzled in the he Duke. Was frazzled. Yeah. yeah. And I understand that. I, I really, I really like him. I, he didn't I like people that don't know, know him would look at that game and say, Oh, he's not that good. I think he is that good. I, but you know, let's see the proof is when he plays. Right. Um, I, I, I think it gave him a lot. It, well, it had to give him some confidence knowing that, you know, he survived that game, that last touchdown that he ran in was beautiful. <laughs> and I think 
it helped. That really helped that he played in that game. It has to help. Um, you know, it, he, it wasn't it wasn't what UM fans wanted or expected, but the guy won the game for them in the end, and um, it's going to help him in this game. And as far as who who's going to start this game, I mean. The, you know what you were saying? I, Kane Sport did report last week, right? right. You said that TBD uh, was going to get reevaluated, w- probably wouldn't play this game, would get reevaluated. The thing is, <laughs> things changed. That was before. Right. That was a week. Jake, yeah. That was before Jake played in that game, mm-hmm. in that last week's game. So I think it's a great sign that Jake is even throwing the ball. We really don't know. We really don't know what he's doing in practice. No matter what, we don't see any practice. We really don't know. I I don't know. And it's a very good sign that he's practicing at all or throwing the ball. I mean, after that hit, I thought, wow, did he, I don't know. Yeah, It looked like it could have been a separated shoulder or broken collarbone or something. And yeah. Yeah. We don't really know what it is still, but, um, just the idea. I mean, Mario is, it's definitely football chess. I mean, I, that's obvious. He's making sure FSU prepares for both quarterbacks. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what my gut is who will, I'm not sure of my gut who's going to start. I don't even, I don't, I don't even have a gut, but if Jake starts uh, and doesn't, and doesn't do well, and Tyler's going to be aching to get in there. And if he can, at all play I think they're going to play him what about you yeah Uh, first of all I want to go back on Jake real quick because I I think the biggest takeaway I have from the Virginia game like you said um you think he's still going to be good I think the biggest takeaway is like you know half the battle with a a highly touted recruit is are they willing to try to improve you know do they care for, for lack of a better word and I think you saw um Really, in every, every time he's been on the field, you, you saw you've seen it. Um, obviously, the interceptions are are discouraging. Um, but I think the way, yeah, you know, I, I think I use the word moxie at, at the top there to describe him. I think he's got like that. He's obviously got the leadership, like you can just tell from talking to other guys. Um, and I think he's got that. You know, you and you can look at the way he bounced around in high school, just trying to find a way to play as a senior. You know, at basically three different high schools as a senior with at very, you know, one in California, there was no season because of COVID and winds up at a school in Georgia, eventually gets ruled ineligible there and has to go to a different, like he did everything he could to play. Um, And then, you know, obviously I think um, the way that, you know, the the way that he kind of hung in there in that Virginia game and was able to pull it out at the end, I think is like a positive sign about like this, he wants to be good. He knows he needs to be better, obviously. And I think he's got that, um, you know, the kind of the intangible factors you look for in a quarterback. And we obviously know he's got, you know, the the physical tools and, and all that stuff based on what he did in high school. Um, my gut, I I think Tyler Van Dyke is going to dress is the way I kind of feel. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. You know, we saw Ja'Kai Clark did this a couple of times a, a few weeks ago, and it's, it's easier to do with, like, an offensive lineman than a quarterback, I think, right? Because you know, yeah. usually you want to stick with one quarterback the whole game, but um, where maybe in an emergency he gets in. Um, the way they're they're talking about it, though, it, it sure sounds like he's pretty close to playing. And I think if he is, if he's pretty close. And the one thing we don't really know is whether it's a pain tolerance deal or discomfort tolerance, or if there's like a risk of, you know, if he takes another hit is a risk that it becomes a more serious injury. Um, if the latter is the case where you're risking more serious injury, I, I don't think there's any way he plays, but if it's just a deal of like, you know, he, maybe his arm strength is not going to be quite as good. Maybe, um, you know, maybe it'll, it'll get sore if he throws 10 times in a row. Um, I think if it, it's that kind of situation, he'll play. And um, I, I kind of, Again, this is based on just talking to, to Mario and, and a couple of players and, and not seeing practice. I, it kind of feels to me like they're, they're, they're I don't want to say expecting him to play this weekend, but like there's a real, real chance that he's going to play. Yeah, and I, but David, I really don't, I can't stand seeing 
like two co- like quarterbacks swapping. No, and, and well, if, if, Ty- if Tyler I starts, he's got to be your guy. You can't be like, oh, yeah, like, Tyler goes in and all that. Like it just looks terrible yeah. because you didn't. Bank. It looks, it but, looks like, terrible, and and Tyler's not good with that. I, he shouldn't be. He needs to get into a rhythm. Yeah. Oh, you know. So I, I, I agree. I agree with you. I just hope it's not like they put Jake in and they do something like trying to be, trying to be tricky or whatever, and then they put for a couple series and they put Tyler. I don't. Tyler needs to get into a rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. And, Tyler's in. He's got to be in, unless, like I said, he's the emergency backup, and right. um, it comes to that. But I don't think they're going to risk, like you said, bad injury. I don't think his no his chance. Peeps, his peeps, his parents, his whatever. They're not. They're they're not going to. He still has NFL dreams. Yeah, in this I mean, season I, where they're four and four and just trying yeah. to cling to bowl hopes, like yeah, he's he's only going to play if it's if he's healthy. Um, and by healthy, I mean no risk of re no risk of more serious injury. Um, yeah, and the and the thing with Garcia also is that I've seen over the years with new quarterbacks, young quarterbacks, the question a lot of them end up throwing picks in their mm-hmm. in their their first few games or or not taking care of the ball that well if they can rebound from that and and when it's crunch time throw it out of bounds just simple stuff like that instead of trying to make a play that's where you see the uh, quarterbacks grow a lot yeah and you know there are obviously great quarterbacks who in their debut right away look like stars you know some of these Clemson guys they've had over the last few years um you know Bryce Young last year (laughs) against Miami right um but I mean even Tyler Van Dyke um, yeah, I throw out the Central Connecticut State game last year, which was technically his first start. Um, and then what were the next? It was, um, I can't remember what was the first game, Virginia? No, Virginia, I don't know, but whatever. His first two starts one was against North Carolina on the road, um, and NC State maybe was the one before that. Um, they were they, they weren't good, like, remember how and not bad, but like they weren't it took time for Tyler Van Dyke to be Tyler Van Dyke. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not throwing out Jake Garcia based on um, one awful performance, I would say against Duke and one, um, I don't know, not good performance. I would say Saturday. I don't know if I would say awful because at least he took care of the ball and um, made plays at the end, but uh, you know, young quarterbacks get better week to week and, and Florida state is, um, a t- much tougher challenge, we should say, than Duke or Virginia. I mean, that's Jared Verse, their star edge rusher transfer is, you know, a potential American. They've got some good DBs. Um, so it's, you know, he's he's going to get knocked around probably, unlike he did, certainly against Virginia and probably even tougher task than Duke, although Duke got to him a lot. Um, but I, I think a full game and a half really two games now because he also played against middle tennessee a lot um it i think would i like it i i don't think if he starts it's just a lost cause for miami i I, is how i don't i don't yeah i don't think i agree i don't think so and by the way van dyke was sacked four times in the game against virginia last year which was after central connecticut state that was the first game was virginia then north carolina right yeah yeah, then it was North Carolina. Then and he was then really was, bad in the first half of both of those games. And and by exactly. the second half of the North Carolina game, it just clicked and he was exactly and then North Carolina State was the one that the players were angry at him. And oh right, yeah, that was the next week. Yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah. The first the win was North Carolina State. That was a big that was really big. And then he was on from there. First ACC win. Yeah. Yeah. So um yeah, we'll see. We're we really don't know. I mean, yeah. we'll it's always a good game uh, to me. Even the bad games are good games. Even the b- dumb, bad. I've seen games where they were kind of like boring. And then at the end, not many, not many yeah. between Miami and Florida State. But then at the end, uh, somebody dropped the snap, a holder right. dropped the snap and somebody picks it up. Or I know uh, there's always some crazy thing. There's always tension. The players, uh, even la- even last year. Um, uh, approach each other at the, at the midfield um, before the final quarter, and we thought there was going to be a fight. Um, it's pretty intense, and you know, 
Yeah, there have really only been two blowouts in the last decade in this game. One was in, in 2013, which was the Flo- national champion Florida State team. Um, actually, a top 10 matchup. But, but that's before my time on in Miami, so I don't really remember why Miami was up at number seven that year. But um, Florida State killed, killed everyone that year and killed Miami on the way to the national championship. Um, and then uh, two years ago when Derek King and Miami yeah. absolutely – like that was – that's the biggest beatdown I can remember in this game. Yeah, um, 52 10. It was the big biggest beatdown. Oh, down. right. It was it was literally the biggest margin of victory in uh my yeah. Florida State game. Since and, not yes, yeah, since the rivalry began in 51, 1951. So yeah, so. Well, I mean the common thread I would say with those two wins. One, you know, again, Miami was ranked in that 2013 matchup, but I don't think ended up being particularly good that year. Um so that was a you know, the, the discrepancy between those two teams is really big. That's one of that Florida State team is one of the best teams in modern college football history. Um, and then two years ago, that was uh, a, I would say, very good Miami team and a really bad Florida State team. Um, so at pretty much every other time, a lot, most of these games otherwise have been, um, you know, a good, you know, one team is good, one team's like average, or both teams are good, right. or both teams are average. And then that's kind of how I feel about this game i mean maybe maybe you know miami still might wind up being a really bad team right they might not make a bowl like but at the same time this florida state team not particularly good i I would say kind of fringe top 25 but only five and three it got a win against lsu but have lost to every other ranked team they've played um so i but the losing has been kind of close right they battle all those teams yeah some good teams yeah yeah Um, so like, to me, this is a game where the two teams are still even enough, you know, Florida state's clearly better than Miami this year, but, um, the two teams are, are even enough where this I'd be stunned if this isn't a close competitive game and deep into the second half. It will be competitive and it will be chippy. Uh, so that's always very interesting to me and we always have to have our eyes peeled on the on the field because you never know what's going to happen the next play um and i think this game will have i mean there's only four games left and uh yeah. four regular season games obviously miami uh needs three more no needs two more two more two more um to get to uh get to a bowl game but yeah. if florida state wins this they qualify for a bowl right so so i i mean that i know it sounds funny in past years i would never say wow they're battling for bowl eligibility which i'm saying this year but that's like embarrassing yeah, yeah. A you know? win would go a long way toward bowl eligibility because they, they still play clemson and we've got that penciled in as a loss so it if you lose to Florida State, you got no wiggle room, right? You got to beat um, Georgia Pitt. Tech. You got to beat Georgia Tech. You got to um, beat Pitt, right? And then, and then that's beat Florida it. State. It gives you a little bit more wiggle room, obviously. In Florida, yeah, games. exactly. In Florida State, they'll be celebrating. You know, if they can win uh, at Hard Rock, you know, there's finally going to be a, a huge crowd or a big crowd. I shouldn't say huge, but I, there there will be because Florida State fans come. A lot of Florida State fans will be there. It'll be it'll be fun. It'll be like a real college atmosphere. Yeah, Miami hasn't lost at home to Florida State since 2016, which was Mark Rick's first season, right? Yeah, 2016. So, is that um, 20, and, and UM? Uh, yeah, I mean, it it'll 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 be whoever wins will be like really. Uh, For both teams, it's the biggest game on the calendar. I mean, Florida State, obviously, like I said, is. A well good team they're going to make a bowl they could make a pretty big bowl but they're not competing for the orange bowl they're not competing for the acc um, right this is the biggest game left on on the schedule for them well i don't know florida state loves playing florida i guess florida yeah they, uh, they love yeah. taking care of everybody that's the one thing they have in common other than a lot of kids have played in high school together yeah. and grew up together in this game uh everybody wants to beat florida yeah um, the I would say the biggest positive development to come out of that Virginia game is that the running game finally got going. Um, Henry Parrish goes over 100 yards, um, which they really yeah. needed because Jake only threw for 170 or something like that, no touchdowns. Um, they needed, 
you know, we, we've talked about it a million times that they want this identity to be like a power game, a run game. Um, and Henry <laughs> Parrish, I think, has been really good whenever he's been in the lineup. He's obviously been injured a little bit. Um, the, they've got not a whole lot of depth behind him right now because it doesn't seem like they trust Jalen Knighton or, or Thad Franklin. Um, but if, you know, he doesn't need to go for 100 yards every week, especially when Tyler Van Dyke is in the lineup but they need that threat because they've been bad in situational football. They've been, oh, bad, they have. They've been bad in third and short. Um, and I, I think they, it, if, if Harris can give them what he gave them on Saturday, then that's another part of the reason why Miami's got a shot this weekend. Yeah, I agree. It's, I think it's a little disconcerting that he's the only running back. Yeah, that's an issue. I mean, how much he, I, I think, I, mean, I think Knighton will get back in there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I guess I don't know. I don't know. I that is, Lucia Stanley. Lucia, yeah, and I don't that that has good, a really good average. I did a story there; it's in the paper today. You know, I, I mean, he has a really good per carry average. I don't know. I mean, they they, they don't have any fumbles for him, but he might have fumbled. I can't. The stats aren't always correct, honestly, yeah. so I'm not sure. But. Um, Josh Gaddis, the offensive coordinator, did not seem, I mean, he said right out that, you know, they've got to prove that they both pl- practice hard, Thad and Jalen, but you got to do it on the field. And he said at this point of the season now, you know, we're coming down to it and they can't, I don't, they can't take chances. So I, it'll be interesting to see if Jalen gets the ball or how they, how they deal with that. But yeah, I know right. that it's hard on Parrish to be the only running back. Right. And Knighton, you know, his numbers are not great, but obviously we know he's got talent. He's uh, yeah. been very good as a receiver in his career. Like, to me, it, to me, the reason he wasn't playing is, has to be basically, I don't want to say all because of the fumble thing, because, again, like, he's only averaging – he's averaging less than four yards a carry. But the fumble thing is – But that's why. Was, was, yeah, like it was that's... kind of like a punishment. Like, you've got to figure this out or you're not going to play, um, I, I think, one game out of the lineup. Um, and they could ride Henry, right? Because Henry was so good in that game and they needed, right. they needed it too, right? They weren't throwing as much. Like Knighton is in there more on passing situations because he's a good receiver. So I, I, I they've got to get him back involved this week um, because, it, you know, it doesn't seem like that is going to be much more than maybe a short yardage guy from time to time. And, and Lucian Stanley, like I said, I, I kind of like him, but, you know, he's a walk on and, um, you know, Donald Cheney, it sounds like he'll be back by the end of the regular season, but that's still a few weeks away. But, so they, yeah. need, they need someone to be a placeholder in the meantime. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I think that I don't think that that doesn't have any touchdowns, I think. And, you know, so they need them to come through in the red zone also. And I guess in sh- short yardage down near touchdown. Yeah, I mean, they didn't score a touchdown. We, like the big issue with this yeah. offense all year, even when Tyler was in there and they were piling up yards is, they were not scoring touchdowns. And right. that's the one thing that Virginia game certainly did not assume assuage, assuage. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Uh, any concerns assuage. about assuage? Yeah. Uh, it did not assuage any concerns about uh, Miami's touchdown scoring ability because uh, they didn't score any touchdowns. Yeah, it definitely. And by the way, Jake, I, I, I'm looking at stats. He threw for 125 yards last week. 125. You know, I think it was the week before he threw for 170. Yeah, but he held the. Yeah. You know, and he, he, it's okay. There were no turnovers. Um, we, we said they've corrected things each week that they screwed up on the week before the penalties. Yeah. They're great. The, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the turnover, eight turnovers or whatever, no turnovers last game. Um, yeah, maybe now they can just score touchdowns. They're kind of poking know. holes on the canoe, right? Where it's like you poke a hole and the water shoots out of somewhere else. Like they kind of got a lot of issues. Um, but at least they're fixing some of them yeah um you got anything left on this game or do you want to move on to recruiting really quick before or i gotta have michelle kaufman on actually after um do a bit little preview before uh they tip things off on monday by the way poor michelle she wrote that that column about she writes the timing was a little suspect she wrote i love all her columns but she wrote that column of that uh come on miami fans you Uh know come to the games basketball and football I mean it's you know she was very generous saying it looked like there were 40,000 fans when they announced 50 something thousand whatever game she was there last game Uh Um, but um 
the thing is, this is a game that there will be. There fans. will be, yeah. I think it was more basketball because the basketball fan support last year was really. But, but, I would hope. She talked about basketball and women. Oh my God, she sent me a picture, a photo of the women's. It was it, it was an exhibition. Yeah, exhibition. Yes, right. right. It was an exhibition. But, uh, no, their okay. attendance is bad David, for all basketball. Their attendance is bad. And David, the, there was like the one person in the state. I mean, there was like it was embarrassing. The picture. There was like yeah. two people watching her. I'm. Yeah, was, especially the men's team. That team is good. And is, you know, they got one of the best coaches yeah. in the country. Like uh they, they gotta get better. I would think they'll have better fan support this year than they did last year because people didn't trust it last year, and now they're coming off the Elite Eight. So um uh recruiting, we should talk recruiting real quick because Miami pulled off one of uh, one of the biggest recruiting stunners I can remember, at least like in you know, obviously there's there's stunners every year, but like Miami related stunners. There was a couple of years ago when George Pickens, I think surprised a lot of people by going to Georgia. Um, now a receiver for the Steelers and yeah, valuable I, I mean, my fantasy team. Um, <laughs> but, uh, this is a stunner. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was good. Cormani of McLean, but to, like, go ahead. Sorry, Lakeland kid, five-star cornerback, number two player in the country, according to 24 seven sports composite rankings. Um, I'll, I'll say Cormani, you know, he's in Lakeland, which is a big, big program. One of the best programs in the state, but you know, it's not Miami. It's not, Atlanta like it's not Texas he's not doing interviews all the, like you know there's some kids who talk all the time because people are at their games all the time so he keeps it a little quiet um announces the top three of Miami Florida and Alabama which the top three was not necessarily surprising um Miami you know he played for South Florida Express Miami had been in the mix for a long time um got a good re- really good relationship with Demarcus Van Dyke um, and had a really good relationship with Travaris Robinson when Travaris Robinson was here. Obviously, T. Rob goes to Alabama. That's right. why Alabama's in the mix. And then Florida. Everyone just figured Florida is the favorite because he's from Lakeland. Lakeland kids tend to go to Florida. The Pouncy Twins. Um, you know, Ahmad Black is on their staff. Like the, it's it's a reliable pipeline for Miami. Um, and then decision day comes and. I think the Miami pick stunned pretty much everyone. You, you look. Uh, there was somebody, David. Some which website? I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but there was a major website that pre-recorded. Oh, I didn't see that. I was at a wedding over the weekend, so oh I can't. Oh my god! Missed. I don't. Texted me, were like, "Whoa!" It was a major <laughs> one. I don't want. I don't. I, I think I know yeah. which one it is, but I don't want to say it in case it wasn't uh, a major uh, website or major out, uh, media outlet recorded pre-recorded their, their podcast that he had their reaction that he had signed with florida excuse me that he had committed to florida okay mm-hmm. so they're doing this they put up this whole video talking about how he went going to florida and the great news and whatever and it was a total embarrassment i guess yeah i mean yeah, you not can't, good. Do can't do you can't pre-do that but a nice reminder of how surprising this was um and yes. A reminder, I think, for everyone to let's not doubt Mario Cristobal on the recruiting trail. I think last week we recorded and I was like, I don't know if they're going to add a lot more kids to this class. And then, of course, they go get the number one player in the country. And then the next day they flip a uh, really interesting safety linebacker hybrid from uh, Oklahoma, which, you know, it's only a three star kid. But flip a kid from Oklahoma is, you know, pretty obviously it means something. Um, Yeah, Cormani is. Uh, you know, that's his bigger recruiting win. You know, obviously Miami, Francis Maigoa is a big one. Um, they're going to be in the mix for Samson Okanlola, five-star tackle. Like maybe like just because of the position, those are bigger um, additions, right? You want tackles. That's the most important recruiting position, I would, other than quarterback probably. Um, but to pull that commitment out of nowhere and beat out one of your rivals, um from one of from really your, your rival's recruiting footprint that you I can't remember the last Lakeland High kid to commit to Miami. They've uh they've gotten kids from Polk County, Cleveland Reed uh is from Polk County, but not a lot of Lakeland High kids. Um that's a that's a big deal. And um, you know, it's it, all, all of a sudden like Miami's got the chance to like really get some momentum rolling, which is like stunning to say about a four and four team, right? They they get a yes. five-star commitment, beat a bad Virginia team, but whatever. You win a game um, to get back to 500. And now you got Florida State this week, where obviously they're going to have a ton of recruits in the building. Um, if you beat Florida State, then 
all of a sudden this team is like I it's hard to be that angry about the current standing of the Mario Cristobal regime obviously five and four is bad for a team that was favored to win the coastal um and just you know basically fell out of that race right away once ACC play started um but a chance to really finish the year strong and um you know Cormani's going to be at the game this weekend they're going to have they're going to be recruiting other kids like um you know Miami is getting that first year recruiting bump that that you expect and, and Mario Cristobal is is delivering on, on at least that part of we talked about it a million times what were the things Mario Cristobal not explicitly promised but the promise of Mario Cristobal was good o-line play discipline and recruiting and yeah. they're he's definitely delivering on the recruiting end of it right now yeah and it's contagious I, yeah, I think is. A, a, a five-star kid commits to Miami right and comes to the game that's why the, this game is so important it really is for a lot of reasons I, because they win okay now they've won two in a row right and then now they have three games left they could in everybody's minds fans hopeful people players recruits they could win five in a row and end the season eight and four I'm not saying they're going to but they're that hope is there and it's going in the right direction and and recruits love that stuff I mean it I it can only help them if they win this game in every way they start now they start the recruits start trying to get other guys and um, Mario will be on top of the world and yeah you know yeah and um I mean we should say Cormani like the O-line is a big deal because the position but Cormani as a cornerback is a big deal too because this team has um had some cornerback issues over the last few years and Tyreek Stevenson could be back next year which would be a big boon but he could also go to the draft he'll probably get drafted or at least the roster but DJ Ivy the other starter this is gonna be his last year um right you know to Corey Couch is a very different kind of you know he's a true nickel guy it's hard to imagine him getting like full time on the outside um and the depth at the corner you know Daryl Porter's been okay like but the depth at cornerback has been an issue this year too yeah uh, great and I told the guy you just look at the way he's built and the type of athlete he is he, he's a guy who could come in and day one and and help you out corners do that I think Kevin Steele wasn't it uh was it this week I think we asked him about Leonard Taylor and he was like take time with offensive linemen sometimes you can just stick a corner out there on an island and say don't let anyone run past me and that could be Cormani next year. Yeah. He also said, you can play with emotion, but don't be emotional. <laughs> yeah. That's what I remember from Kevin. Ke- there you go. That's a, that's a good quote. That, that's a good quote to leave it on as we, uh, as Florida State comes into town this weekend, because there's always something, right? Whether always it's always something, a fight or a scrap or uh, guys running across each other midfield and yelling at each other. Um, and you know, Mario Cristobal, like that, he does not want that. Like that is his, no, he, he's he like, you can't talk unless you can back it up. And even if you can back it up, you probably shouldn't be talking. So um, he wants the, no bulletin idea. board material. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a, that's a very good idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. You can follow Susan on Twitter at S Miller Degnan. Uh, she'll obviously be out at Hard Rock Stadium this weekend for Florida State. Um, the most fun weekend of the year, probably in this Miami season. So uh be sure to follow her Definitely. and check out everything she writes this weekend uh, we're going to take a quick break now and i'll be back with michelle kaufman our basketball beat writer to do a quick basketball preview before they tip off next week all right we are joined now by michelle kaufman our miami basketball beat writer here at the herald um season tips off uh next week had a couple scrimmages over the last week um the men uh beat iup uh, the fighting Indianans of Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, on Sunday, the women uh, played their scrimmage uh, Wednesday night uh, at Watsco Center. Um, the big story coming out of both, I think, was, or the big intrigue, I guess I should say, going into both, was the play of these new transfers um, across both teams. Uh, the men obviously made a big stir when they uh, got Nigel Pack, kind of like the on the forefront of the summers like nil madness um point guard coming in from kansas state um also added norshad omir who uh lower profile transfer but um as you wrote it was kind of uh pretty impressive in that debut interesting i would say um definitely 
um, filling some of that void down low. And then the women kind of made, it's, it's, I won't say an equally big splash, but not as big a women's basketball transfer splash as there was when they get the Cavender twins who are um, TikTok stars, but also pretty good uh, basketball players. Um, let's start with the men um, and particularly the two transfers. What did you think of them in the scrimmage and what, you know, for Miami fans who are now just kind of popping in, I think a lot of people know about PAC. We might have even brought you on to talk about PAC over the summer. I can't remember. Um, but Omir was the other guy who I think popped out a little bit on Sunday night. What, what, what should people know about these two freshmen going in and what did you think of them in their quote unquote debut over the weekend? Yeah. I mean, North shot Omir is going to be, I think, I mean, several of the players said, and I agree, I think he's going to be a big surprise. I think he could be, he could be uh, sort of a steal uh, in the transfer portal. because From Arkansas was, State, we should say. So coming from a smaller school. He came from Arkansas State. Yeah, the big thing, what, what Coach Larnaga said, what Coach L says is that the biggest question with him is, you know, how he will adapt to ACC. You know, how is he going to adapt to, to higher level play? Because he totally dominated at Arkansas State, and you could see that against IUP the other night, which is also not an ACC school. Um, he is just really big, really strong. You know, he's 6'7", but he's 250 pounds, and he can jump out of the gym. I mean, his jumping ability for a guy 250 pounds is amazing. He's very versatile. He's going to be, you know, he could be a real force down low. He's never faced some of the big players that he's going to face in the ACC. The big men he's faced are not like what he's going to face in the ACC, but he has a lot of potential. And the other thing that he just brings without question is energy. He is just this, you know, boundless energy, a huge smile on his face all the time. He's from Nicaragua. He's the very first and only Nicaraguan player in division one basketball. There has never been a Nicaraguan player and he really takes that seriously. He wants to inspire other young Nicaraguan kids to go into basketball. So I think he's going to be a favorite down here with the Hispanic community because he's super engaging. He's really friendly, very energetic, big smile, and, you know, is going to be adored, I think, by any Hispanic fan that follows this team and non-Hispanic fans too. But mm -hmm. I think he can be... You know, they lost some size, uh, you know, with Sam Wardenberg and whatever. And and I think that Norchad is, he's even thicker and stronger, uh, not quite as tall, but I think he's going to fill that void of losing Sam Wardenberg. And then Nigel Pack, the big question is, you know, everyone wants to know losing Charlie Moore and Kim Augusti. Those are two really big losses. Yeah. They were team leaders and, you know, Charlie Moore would just did such a good job at the point. Nigel really has not played the point. He's a shooting guard who's kind of transitioning into playing the point. So, uh, but he's going to get help from Bensley Joseph. Uh, Bensley is going to, you know, bring the ball up some. And Jordan Miller is going to bring the ball up a lot more than he did last year. Coach L has been talking about Jordan Miller over the summer. His assist to turnover ratio was four to one. And uh, they really trust him with the ball. He's a very smart player, makes good decisions. So uh, Nigel is, is, is a sharp shooter. He can shoot from outside. He's, he's kind of brought in to replace Charlie Moore. Yeah, he's he the play exactly him. like Charlie, yeah. but he came, you know, he, he comes from a big league. Um, he's a proven player and uh, you know, he seems to be fitting right in. He and Isaiah Wong already have a good um, you know, kind of a good partnership. So I think that's going to be a, a smooth transition. Yeah. Omir is, you know, he, he's going to give him a different look down low, I think is the interesting thing, right? Like they, like you said, Pack is as close as you're going to get in the transfer portal as a one-to-one -one replacement for Charlie Moore. Um, you know, obviously they got Wong and Miller back. They're going to play four out with those four, three guards plus Wuga Puplar uh, as the other wing there. Um, obviously they need someone to step up and fill the McGusty scoring void. I think the hope probably is that Wong takes up, you know, takes another step right um, obviously pack is probably a, a better scorer than charlie moore even if he's not as good a passer um but omir is like he's really going to change the complexion right of this team because 
you know, they were really playing five out a lot because Sam Wardenberg is a guy who's much co- more comfortable as an offensive player on the perimeter than he was right. banging in the post. Yeah, and this guy's a real this guy's a real banger in the post. Yeah, I mean, he's this not guy, a shooter. He's, he's not, I don't think he's ever made a three pointer in college. Uh, right. He's very physical. You know, they're going to have a physical presence in there and he's he's going to be hard to move. You know, he's he's really thick. I mean, he he looks like a football player, to be honest. He weighs 250 and he's just a big, big, strong, thick guy, big shoulders, big back, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's kind of similar to Anthony Walker, I guess, a little bit, right, where it's, um, you know, a similar, like, undersized center, but great athlete. Um, yeah. So they, they got two guys they're going to probably use in that spot. Yes. Um, who are similar, so you're going to have the same kind of look. Whereas when Walker came in last year, it was such a different look than what Mordenberg was in. So a little bit more right. continuity, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, I think and and you know, coach seems pretty pretty positive and confident for this early in the season. So, you know, it it the fact that they got Isaiah Wong back was really huge and uh Jordan Miller is planning to have a huge year. He says that he's being he's a sleeper. Everyone is sleeping on him and and coach L kind of insinuated the same thing that he's really improved over the over the summer and is determined to just, you know, have a huge season this year. So, it should be fun. It should be really fun to see how they do coming off an elite eight. It's, it's a yeah. big, you know, it's a big, uh, a big challenge for them to get back there, but they, they seem pretty confident. Um, moving over to the women, um, the Cavender twins are the the big headliners and, you know, this women's program has had obviously Katie Meyer became the program's all or the bas- Miami basketball's all time wins later last year, but this team still hasn't made it out of the, the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. Um, Obviously, like I said, the Cavender twins, I think a lot of people probably know them as TikTok stars. I don't think either of us are on TikTok. Um, <laughs> what? But they're good, too. I mean, the um, you know, Mountain West stars uh, before they got to Miami. Um, what what yeah. what what's the big takeaway? What 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 do you what impressed you about what they did on Wednesday? And are they going to be the, the real engines of this team? Yeah, I mean, I think what what impressed me and what has, I had not seen them play until last night, right. but I kept hearing and hearing their basketball players first, their basketball players first. Yes, they make TikTok videos in bikinis. Yes, that's true. And they have four million followers for that reason. Um, but they are really good basketball players. They're very dedicated. What what impressed me last night is Haley. Haley started. Haley's in the starting lineup. Uh, she's a little bit more of a scorer, a little more aggressive, more assertive. Um, Hannah's more of a facilitator, but uh, they're both good. They're both very much students of the game. They spend a lot of time in the office with Katie going over film and everything. Um, what impressed me is that Haley scored the first basket of the season, a three pointer, like, you know, less than a minute into the game. She took the ball, went to the corner, did not hesitate at all and put up a three for the first baskets of the season. And, you know, that showed a lot of confidence and a lot of guts, you know, for someone who's under a lot of pressure coming in new with all of the attention on them because of they, they've, the estimates are that they've made about a million dollars in NIL. They are among the highest mm-hmm. paid college athletes, you know, in NIL sponsorship money. So there's a lot of pressure on them, a lot of spotlight on them. I can tell you that the page views for my women's stories since they arrived are way, way, way higher than they were before. Um, so, you know, I was just curious, uh, how are they as basketball players, which is what I think everyone wants to know. And the truth is they're, they're team players. Absolutely. In fact, Hannah, uh, Hannah basically got reamed out by Katie last night, not reamed up, but I mean, yelled out, scolded because she had six assists, but she passed up what Katie felt were some makeable shots. And she, you know, she doesn't want her, she wants her to have assists, but she also wants her to shoot when she's open and. Hannah is more, you know, more likely to pass the ball than to shoot. And Katie wants them both to shoot because they both are capable shooters. And uh, Haley is just a little bit more aggressive and gutsy. And Hannah is a little bit more student of the game, likes to take what the defense gives her and likes to provide a lot of assists. But they're both good. There were many times last night that they were both on the court Mm -hmm. together. And uh, so I think they definitely add. They add a lot of energy, all the other players, their teammates. I was curious how the teammates were going to respond to them right. because let's be honest, you have these two, you know, TikTok stars showing up, getting all the headlines and the attention and all these other women like Destiny Harden, they've been here, 
you know, uh, Carla Erlovic, they've been here. And all of a sudden you have these new two players coming in, getting all the attention, but they, uh, all the players have said the same thing that they really are team players. They have blended right in. They are not just because they, that the social media stuff is on the side. Their first priority really is basketball. And, and you could see it last night. There was no question. They are, they're basketball, they're hoopsters. They are basketball yeah. players. They're gym rats. Katie said that they show up early in the morning and they, they encourage the other players to work harder in the gym. So uh, I think that def they're definitely going to provide an engine, just like Norchad Omir brings a lot of, everyone has been using the word, the same word energy mm -hmm. for the Cavender twins and for Norchad Omir. They, they, those are transfers who are bringing a new energy and positivity to both teams. And I think that that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So going back to the men before we wrap things up, because obviously they are coming off, you know, in some ways the best season in program history around to the elite eight. Um, not the best regular season program history, but still it impressed like they were good in the regular season, probably underseeded because the ACC was underrated. Um, now, uh, obviously, the ACC is kind of an interest. You know, North Carolina's in a lot of people's mind the number one team in the country, but Duke's right. a, a period of flux with Coach K leaving. Um, can this Miami team? I'm not going to say are they going to be better. Like, could they get to the Elite Eight? Because that's uh, it's impossible to say how far a team's going to get in the tournament on November 3rd when we're recording this, but can this team be in the regular season as good or better as last year's team, even with um, the losses of Charlie Moore and Cam Augusti? Do you think those, the, the guys they brought in and Isaiah Wong being back can make this team, you know, as I think uh, certainly everyone thinks they're going to be a tournament team, right? They're kind of fringe top 25 in the preseason, um, but can this team yeah, match last year's accomplishments? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think the big question mark, you know, the big question mark is really going to be at the point guard position mm -hmm. because Charlie Moore was just such a surprise, I think. Yeah, I mean, a perfect this, fit right away. It was just like right away. It was right a away. perfect fit right away. And he made, he won several games with these crazy, you know, really long range half point shots, craziness, you know. They won some games because of Charlie yeah. Moore. And Even it was a perfect fit with the their other... two scores on the wing. It was just, it was a perfect situation for him. He didn't have to score that much, but he could. Right. Obviously. Yeah. So it was, I mean, I really think that that's the only question is, 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 you know, Nigel Pack, will he be able to, you know, I don't think he's going to be, he's not going to be the same as Charlie Moore, but I do think the, the addition of Norchad Omir does give them a different option, which is going to make them a little more, you know, a, a different look, but, but, they're going to have a strength that they did not have last year. I do think that Jordan Miller, I, I just from everything I've seen and heard, barring injury, I think he's going to have a really breakout season this year. I really do. And he may make up for some of the loss of Cam Augusti and all that. And, you know, Isaiah Wong and, and the other guys who are back, Wuga, Wuga was telling me that last year as a freshman, the game was like a blur to him. It was too fast. He yeah. just couldn't catch up. And now he really feels like he's on pace with the rest of the players. Yeah. So I think that the guys from last year getting to an elite eight, that's going to give them a lot of confidence going into this season that they are good, good enough and capable enough to play with all the good teams because they did it last year in March. So, um, yes, I would, if I had to make a prediction, I would say that this team will be in the regular season as good or better than they were last year. Mm -hmm. But Charlie Moore, was a special, special player that yeah. doesn't come along all the time. And, and I haven't seen Nigel Pack play enough. He struggled with his shot a little bit in the opening exhibition, but it was just an exhibition. Maybe he was nervous, whatever. Um, I need to see a little bit more of him before I could make a better prediction. But they have yeah. pieces in place to be a really good ACC team, I think. Yeah, last year's team was obviously really interesting because it was so old, right? That was a lot of the headlines. So old. They were like 24 years old, three of them. Yeah. I think three of them were 24 yeah. years old. Wardenburg, yeah, was the other one who was um, – and Rodney Miller was old too, I think. So they, they had a he bunch of – He was like 25, I think. Yeah, exactly. he was, Yeah, they had a lot of old guys on that team. So it's different. They're not going to have that same uh, maturity physical advantage that, that those right. guys, I think, gave them a little bit last year. Um, we should say Norshad Omir, I, we said he's from Arkansas State, but he was Sunbelt Player of the Year last year and yes. Freshman of the Year the year before that. So he was a star at Arkansas State. He was a star. He dominated there. He yeah. absolutely dominated there. And now the question will be what he can do here. But but everybody's, 
I mean, people around the country even put stuff on Twitter, like, you know, watch this guy, mark yeah. him down, Norchad O'Meara, you know, he could end up being one of the steals of the transfer portal. Yeah. And to me, Wuga is in a lot of ways kind of an X factor because we didn't see him that much last year, right? And now, now they're banking on him being a starting caliber guard. So yes. it's going to be a big leap for him. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, coming off the Elite Eight, so they get some better, you wrote about it this week, some better fan support. I, I think people didn't buy it last year, right? Because it have been a couple of rough years. No, it's just that UM fans, no offense. And I know, you know, they get defensive. But look, I went to University of Miami. And since I've been there, and I was there in the mid 80s, it is a struggle to get UM fans. It's a struggle to get the students. Yeah. You know, when, when I was, I mean, forget it. When I was there, they didn't even have bat, men's basketball for the yeah. first two years. They brought it back in 85. But when I started covering the team with Leonard Hamilton and they were playing at the Miami arena, everybody was saying, oh my God, if they build an on-campus arena, the students will just be able to go. It'll be packed and everybody will come because the fans are from Coral Gables and Pinecrest in South Miami and the place will be packed. On Metro okay. Rail. That stadium has been there for 18 years now, 8,000 seats, and they they can barely ever fill the thing. The students don't come, and it's really sad. And and I don't know. It's just it's a, in Miami does not have a college sports culture because a lot of people are here from other countries where they don't even have college sports, so there's no allegiances to college sports. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, you know, it's just not a college basketball town. No. It's so not. um, you know, it's it's I'll gonna be this a struggle. I'll say the men's team with what they did last year and having Jim Laranega and what they've done over the last decade, they, they've earned it. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you get an uptick. Cause it was, it was pretty rough at early, especially early last year. I don't, I don't think people had high hopes for last year's team and what L on the hot seat. And a lot yeah, of they wait to see like, if they're winning, if they're a top, yeah. when they reach the top five of the ACC standings and they start to make a run, they, they went, they won seven games in a row yeah. and they still weren't drawing fans. Finally, after that run, they started to draw. And of course, when ESPN shows up, the students like to come because yeah. they get to mug for the TV. But yeah, the team has earned with earned the benefit game. of the doubt. They have earned the benefit. People should show up from the beginning of the season. Yeah. And the women's team is exciting, too, to watch. Yeah. I'm telling you, I watched them last night. There are a lot of good players on that team. Destiny Harden is a fantastic yeah. player. And what she did last year in the in the tournament, ACC tournament, was unreal. So yeah. both teams are worth watching. It's a really easy in and out. The tickets are super cheap. I know I'm sounding like a an advertisement for them, but I just think it's it's a shame that they that yeah. the attendance is so low at the Watsco Center. And yeah, they, they were one of our best teams down here. And so, I mean, we had really good teams in the winter last year with the Heat going to the East Finals and the Panthers and the President's Trophy. But the the Canes were really good. They were they were yeah. better than the football team, better than the Dolphins last year, right? Like they were they were really good teams. So um, yeah, I think they they've earned it. Let's get let's get some people in the building there, and it's easy to get there on Metro Rail. Um, very easy very easy in and out it's fun for kids it's it's just a good experience yeah. so all right uh you can follow michelle on twitter at cop sports that's with one f k a u f sports um she'll be at the arena on monday for opening yep. night so uh college basketball season is here my favorite time of the year i'm excited <laughs> uh you can follow me on twitter at db wilson too i'll i'll i'm sure i'll pop out there every once in a while um and so uh, you know, it's a busy time in the sports calendar right now where yep. we got the all six major, you know, the obviously the four major sports plus college football, college basketball, uh, all going on at the same time. So uh, not down here because obviously we're not in the World Series, the Marlins, but uh, everything is going on right now. So uh, thanks, as always, for listening. And we will talk to you guys next week.